just what I needed for this film, the world's deadliest spider. I'm Denzi Klein. For many years now, I've been taking a close look at the secret lives of spiders, and my perception of them is a very different one. I'd like to invite you on a journey into the world of spiders. It's a journey that will astonish you, and perhaps change your attitude to spiders forever. While spiders themselves are usually disliked, their webs can often inspire us with their beauty. And the weaving of an orb web is the ultimate in spider craftsmanship. Long before the dinosaurs, spiders were already using silk to catch their prey. And it's from their first random snares that the classic orb web evolved. To start a new web, the spider lets out a strand of silk to be carried by air currents to a point of attachment. Once the line's caught, the spider can start her web. An old web can take an hour or more in the making. Here it's compressed into a minute. First, the spider lays down a set of lines radiating from a hub rather like the spokes of a cartwheel. Next, a wide spiral scaffolding holds those radial lines in place. The spider moves inwards now, laying down a much tighter spiral. She's using the sticky silk that'll glue her victims to the web. The scaffolding, no longer needed, is eaten by the spider as she goes. Given 400 million years or so, you can do a lot with eight legs, a reel of silk, and a pot of glue. The webs of different kinds of spider can vary greatly, and each carries the unmistakable signature of its maker. Perhaps a few lines of embroidery. There's one spider that places more than embroidery in her web, and she uses her silk in a quite ingenious way. She's found in Australia, and her story begins at night on the leaf litter of the forest floor. The spider attaches a leaf to the silk thread that brought her safely down to the ground. Like a worker on a construction site, she hauls herself and the leaf up into the air. What can a web-building spider want with a simple leaf? Why all the effort to get it several meters up to her building site? Well, unlikely as it seems, when the leaf's placed at the hub of the web, it'll form the spider's retreat or shelter. But not before she's done some work on it. The leaf curler actually uses a spider version of origami. As she weaves from side to side, the silk dries and shrinks, and it's the shrinking property of the silk threads that curls the leaf into shape. It's a job that can take hours, but spiders seem to have infinite patience. Now with her shelter completed, the spider can turn her attention to the getting of food. So she's setting up her permanent insect trap right outside her front door. She uses her legs to span and measure the intervals and attach the sticky silk to each radial line in turn. Web spiders have extremely poor sight. Amazingly, it was by touch alone that the spider found her leaf and changed its shape. It's by touch alone now that she weaves the intricate fabric of her web. And there it is, the perfect web. A work of art to us, a deadly trap for insects, and for the spider, its only means of survival. Origami's fine if you've got the time, but some leaf curlers are lazy. 
So what's wrong with recycling an empty snail shell? Spiders have other uses for silk besides making webs. This enormous ground-dwelling spider uses her unusually long spinnerets to weave a retreat. Spiders have a number of silk glands in their abdomen, each producing a different type of silk. The spider simply controls which silk comes out, depending on the purpose. To make an egg sac, a sort of spider nursery, soft silk's used as a lining, while tough silk will cover and protect it. A silk thread can be used as a safety line if the spider misses its mark. Silk's also used for communication between the sexes. It can turn out to be a male's lifeline, as we'll see later. In an Australian suburb, as people retire for the night, a large female spider comes out of hiding and displays a unique use of silk. Dinopus, the net-casting spider, gazes into space while her long hind legs work rhythmically below. She's weaving the first stage of an ingenious catching device. At a rate of about 200 strokes a minute, the spider combs out a special kind of silk with a row of bristles on each of her hind legs. The combing action can be seen here in slow motion. She attaches the finished threads and now starts combing with the other leg. What started as a ribbon of silk has now become a rectangular net. But how can a scrap of fabric no bigger than a postage stamp catch anything that would make a meal for a big spider? Well, appearances can be deceptive. It's the incredible elasticity of the tiny silk net that makes it an efficient catching device. The spider's ambushing spot is directly above an insect highway. Her night vision is 12 times more acute than ours and she'll detect the slightest movement. Dinobus's special silk has a fuzzy texture. It entangles whatever it touches. But this large ant has a ferocious sting, so the spider must immobilize it further. Dinobus can make several catches a night, but for each one she has to weave a brand new net. Not all spiders hang about in the air to catch their prey. The earliest spiders lived on the ground and used ambushing techniques, as many of their descendants do today. Down under my feet, there's a whole underground world of burrows and holes and hideaways. Among the inhabitants are the trapdoor spiders, best known for their skill at burrowing. The burrows are so well camouflaged, they're remarkably hard to see, unless you know where to look. Most spiders live for only a season or so, but the spider I'm looking for could have lived safe and sound in its burrow for more than 20 years. Somewhere on this little patch of ground, there's a secret door, a door with the best kind of security. It's virtually invisible. It's the hinged lid of a trapdoor spider. Let's see if she's home. 
At this time of the day, there's no risk of the spider jumping out. It's down at the bottom, probably wondering who's lifted the lid on its hiding place. Like all good security doors, the lid fits tightly enough to keep the spider's enemies out. A trapdoor spider's burrow can be more than a meter deep. It's lined with silk, perhaps for the spider's comfort. At night, the spider can detect the vibrations of passing insects with its feet, sensing with incredible accuracy whether a passerby is a potential meal. All spiders are carnivorous, and most kill their prey with venom injected through their fangs. These spiders can go without food for months if necessary, but on a good night, some strike it lucky. Trapdoor spiders and their close relatives are distinguished by large, downward-striking fangs. The venom is produced as droplets at the tip of the fangs and injected when the spider strikes. But it's the high toxicity of its venom that's made the Sydney funnelweb spider the deadliest spider in the world. Funnelwebs live only in Australia, hidden in burrows under rocks and logs. The natural prey of these spiders are the ground-dwelling insects that share their habitat. The venom of the male Sydney funnelweb is five times more toxic than the females. It's because of his wandering during the mating season that he often comes into contact with people. And for some, the consequences can be deadly. Many people have died from the bite of this spider. It's taken decades of research to find an anti-venom and reduce the number of fatalities. But this is still a lethal spider, and the problem is that Sydney gardeners can accidentally dig them up and set them wandering. It may look like a dangerous game, but the cat's not actually at risk. Among backboned animals, the funnelweb's venom is lethal only to the primate group, which is bad luck for people. Research into the Sydney funnelweb's venom continues. It's unfortunate it's that really by encroaching on the spider's habitat, we have put ourselves at risk. <laughs> There's another dangerous spider common around Australian homes, a subspecies of the notorious black widow of America. She's the redback, seen here with her egg sac. The redback's permanent insect trap is made up of extremely strong vertical threads, beaded at the base with a contact adhesive. It's a minefield, a maze with no way out but death, and insects enter at their peril. This ant seems to have some misgivings. She's cleaning her antennae, the sense organs that warn her of danger. Perhaps she's aware of the assassin waiting above her. Red 
Humpback spiders and their relatives use a special comb on their hind feet to wrap their victims. In slow motion, we see the silk as a ribbon of rainbow colors. To the end, it's simply a shroud. In the course of evolution, when insects developed flight, the spiders followed them upwards, not with wings, but with all kinds of aerial traps and snares. Species of Nephila are found in warm climates everywhere, and they're among the biggest spiders in the world. They often build their enormous webs in tropical gardens, where exotic flowers attract large moths and butterflies. This giant spider builds a web so large and strong it's been known to trap small birds, but it's actually designed to catch large insects. The spider has immobilized the butterfly's wings, but they'll form no part of her meal. Slow-flying insects are easily caught, but with such a web, even the world's fastest flying insect, a dragonfly, can be stopped in mid-air. Spider silk may look fragile, but theoretically, if it were big enough, this web could stop an aeroplane in flight. There's something else unique about Nephila's web. These tiny spiders are permanent guests, squatters if you like. As a rule, anything moving about in a spider's web is likely to get snapped up, but this is a special case. The little spiders feed fearlessly on the crumbs of Nephila's meals. It's an association between two species known as commensalism, which simply means feeding at the same table. The commensals clear the web of tiny, unwanted insects. In return, they get to share the real feasts with their giant hostess. Many forest spiders don't make webs or nets to catch their prey. They depend more on speed. A tree trunk frequented by insects may be the venue for a small spider highwayman called Tama. But hers is no ordinary pounce and grab stratagem. By slowing down the action, we can see how she contains the ant between her two tail-like spinnerets. She girdles the ant with silk to immobilize it. Only then can she safely move in for the kill, biting her victim before she eats it at leisure. Tama's ambushing spot is also the retreat where she lies up by day, protected by her low profile and camouflage colors. While Tama whirls, another spider uses a different technique. Jumping spiders cross the open spaces of their small world by leaping, launching themselves at high speed with their front legs. If a spider lands short of its mark, it'll swing safely back to its starting point. Jumping spiders are the extroverts of the spider world. Two of their eight eyes are enormously enlarged for daylight hunting. It's the two big eyes that make these spiders seem less alien than most. Jumping spiders are found all over the world. Many of them are strikingly colored, but because they don't make webs, and most of them are under a centimeter long, they're often overlooked. Jumping spiders seek their insect prey on plants. A sunbathing fly 
can be a real challenge. That fly was too fast even for a jumping spider. But jumping spiders are efficient predators and they'll even tackle other spiders. Once their keen eyes have spied a potential meal, it's just a matter of time. Spiders have exploited all the surfaces of the earth except the deep oceans. But all over the world, in freshwater ponds and streams, there lives a spider that actually includes fish in its diet. Dolomedes, the fishing spider, is an angler that uses no bait and, surprisingly, no silk and fishing line. The hairs on the spider's legs act as hydrofuges or floats. They prevent the spider from sinking through the surface film. While fish swim below, the spider peers down at them. For him, one small fish is as good as a feast. When the spider dives, it's the hairs on his legs, now covered with air bubbles, that bring him back to the surface. So he dries his legs carefully between dives. The little fishes see the spider's distorted shape above them, but show no fear. And that's their undoing. Spiders can't eat solid food. They must crush their prey and pre-digest it, then suck it up as a liquid. This one's turning his catch into fish soup. Flowers attract all kinds of flying insects, so it's not surprising there are spiders around to prey on them. What is surprising is the kind of trickery used by some of these masters of deception. A garden like this can seem very pleasant and peaceful to us, but for an insect, it can hide a thousand perils. Any flower could conceal a predator waiting to pounce, and if you're as small as an insect, a spider like this can seem much larger than life. Speaking of size, here's the true size of the flower spider. Flower spiders are found globally. They don't use webs or traps to catch their prey. They use their wits, and the flowers become their innocent accomplices. Insects that visit flowers by day have keen sight for colour and movement. So the spider must blend with the colour of the flower and sit absolutely still. The flower spider may have to wait days for a suitable catch to arrive, and even then it won't make its move until the victim's at the precise striking distance.
Flower spiders will even catch insects much bigger than themselves. Daisy flowers are perfect ambush sites. The tiny yellow florets provide a feast of nectar. They invite prolonged visits from many kinds of insect or potential victims for a lurking predator. The spider's camouflage is so good, it even fools this butterfly into landing on it. For many spiders, camouflage is effective not just for attack, but as a defense against keen-eyed predators. The idea is to pretend you're anything but a spider, and it works, so long as you don't give the game away by moving. Any lump or bump on a tree may turn out to be a spider. This one looks like a bit of debris until it walks away. We ourselves can be as unaware of the spider's amazing deception as their predators are. Believe it or not, there's a spider in this picture. The flat shape and camouflage pattern of pandacetes help to conceal it. Hairs on its legs hide the shadow that might otherwise give it away. In this case, the disguise is not just for defense, as a tiny bark mantis is about to find out. Some spiders do more than look like their surroundings. They actually look like their prey. You can tell this is an ant by her two antennae and her six legs. But she has a double, a spider. The spider has eight legs. It waves the two extra ones about to imitate the ant's antennae. There are many different species of ant mimicking spiders in Australia and each one specifically mimics the ant it preys on. No one knows quite why this particular ant mimic performs such elegant eurythmics. Perhaps it's to attract the ant's attention. This spider resembles in almost every detail the tree-dwelling weaver ants of tropical Australia. It lives in the ants' territory and preys on them exclusively. The spider has the advantage of being able to hang safely on its silk thread while it feeds on its victim. Living in enemy territory with the numbers stacked against you is risky. These ants are ferocious hunters. The spider's wary of the ants patrolling above. When things get too hot for it, the spider drops on a safety line. It rarely happens, but this time the hunter becomes the hunted and the spider's the loser. It's one thing to look like your victims, but mimicry can take much stranger forms. Australian meat ants live in large, mounded nests at the centre of well-worn foraging tracks. Alongside their trails and nowhere else, a strange little basketwork structure can sometimes be found. It's like a miniature lobster pot 
and it's made by a spider unique to Australia that feeds only on these ants. Not surprisingly, it's called the lobster pot spider. Meat ants forage for food on the vegetation around their nests and trails. Sooner or later, one of the foraging ants comes across a lobster pot and investigates. But what's this? Perhaps the spider simply wasn't hungry. Another ant investigates, and this time the spider comes out. She seems to be tapping out a message the way two ants would do it. They're greeting on meeting. But the ant doesn't respond, and the spider retreats. Never mind, there's no rush, and there are plenty of ants around. Again, the spider taps out her tactile message and lures the ant into her parlour. There's no mistake this time. The unsuspecting victim is seized by the neck and the spider gets her meal. The question is, has this spider cracked the code of ant communication? Until we ourselves learn the language of the ants, how shall we ever know? Of all the spiders that hunt by night, the Australian magnificent spider wins the prize for deceit. She catches her prey by an astonishing confidence trick. The magnificent spider is a renegade orb weaver. What she's combing from her spinnerets is all that's left of the classic web of her ancestors. The single thread she dangles looks like a fishing line beaded with sticky drops. But the chances of catching a flying insect with it seem pretty remote. What's more, this spider is a gourmet, feeding only on male moths of a particular kind. Incredibly, the spider lures her victims with the same scent the female moths use to lure the males for mating. You could say she's stolen their secret formula to use as a decoy. When the male moth homes in on the scent, the spider is already swinging for her supper and her trap line turns out to be more than a fishing line. So the spider gets her supper, but the moth ends up in the arms of a very different female from the one he set out to meet. One of the mysteries surrounding this spider is what actually triggered her off to start swinging her trap line. One night a passing car gave me the clue. It was sound. So I thought I'd try out some other sounds. Of course, what the spider really responds to is the vibration of the approaching moth's wings. But I thought I'd experiment with some different frequencies. seem to work all right. Now I'll just try humming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> 
I don't think she liked that very much. She's folded up her trap line and eaten it. The sex life of spiders is truly remarkable. Before a male goes in search of a female, he has certain preparations to make. On a special thread called a sperm web, this large jawed spider is depositing a droplet of white sperm fluid. The fluid comes from the spider's genital opening, halfway along his body. Now he picks the droplet off the sperm web and sucks the fluid into the special mating organs at the tips of his palps or feelers. It's with these that he'll apply the sperm to the female. For all male spiders, the reproductive process involves what can only be described as masturbation followed by artificial insemination of the female. But directly after sperm induction come the rituals of courtship that are vital to a successful mating. Down in the grass, two lynx spiders are starting an affair. For all spiders that hunt actively by day, courtship is highly visual. The female lynx spider eyes off her suitor. They say some females like hairy legs, but eight of them? The female won't respond until he's identified himself with the correct signals as one of her own kind. The male uses his conspicuous black palps to indicate his intention to mate. He does this by tapping the female with his front legs and waving his palps. She seems to lead him on and then change her mind. Maybe it was his legs. It's among the little jumping spiders that the most elegant rituals of spider courtship can be seen. This little female from the tropics can probably recognize her potential mate at a distance by his black face and white side whiskers. But he still has to establish his identity, not with his palps this time, but with his distinctive black legs. First, he has to get the female's full attention, and that's not easy. persistent and follows her. The male makes his approach with precise ritualized movements of his front legs, like sending a semaphore message. But the female plays hard to get. The rituals of courtship and mating are unique to each species. Eventually, this little female lets the male approach and stroke her head. This puts her into a trance-like state, and the male is able to tilt her abdomen and proceed with mating. Spiders are highly sensitive to touch and vibration, and communication between males and females is usually tactile. This male netcasting spider is on the line to an unmated female. He's fully prepared for mating, and he's presenting his credentials in the special language of his kind. And it's worked. This tangle of 16 legs means the females accepted him. It looks a bit of a mix-up to us, but the spiders know exactly what they're doing. The male's applying one of his fully charged palps to the genital opening on the female's underside.
Part of his palp swells like a balloon as he pumps the sperm fluid into her under pressure. Meanwhile, the female simply gazes into space. Perhaps she's thinking of England. The coiled duct or embolus that transfers the sperm is withdrawn from the female and retracted back into the male's palp. The whole process will be repeated with the other palp. Female spiders need to mate once only. They can store enough sperm to fertilize several batches of eggs. Males can mate several times, and this one's cleaning his palps in preparation for his next mating. Many people believe that female spiders always eat their mates. When the sexes are about the same size, there's little risk. But the female St. Andrew's cross spider is a giant compared with her mate. And the male that courts her courts death. When a male spider approaches a female on her web, he takes his life in his hands he must quickly identify himself as a male rather than a meal. To start with, the little male sits very still on the opposite face of the female's web. He's made a hole in it so he can slip around to her side, but make a dash for safety if she attacks. Now he certainly seems to be risking life and limb to convey a message to the female. The message goes something like this. Look, I think you're a very lovely lady, and I want you to know I'm your kind of guy, and we're going to get on just fine together, so long as you promise to keep your mouth shut. If she doesn't bite his head off for that, he'll go on to the next phase. His object now is to lure her onto more neutral ground, the outskirts of the web. He plucks at the silk thread, playing a tactile serenade that she hears with her feet. She comes out to him, and they mate. But there's something sinister going on behind the male's back. Why is she pulling out that ribbon of silk? It looks as though he might be in trouble. He senses danger and leaps away, but not too far. The experience seems to have left this spider a little unbalanced, not from shock, but because he's only got seven legs left. The female's eating the eighth one. The drive to reproduce is strong and the male makes another approach. If he's lucky, he'll succeed. If he's even luckier, he'll survive. One thing is certain, a male St. Andrew's cross spider is unlikely to die of old age. While some female spiders show a certain lack of affection for their mates, when it comes to motherhood, it's quite a different matter. Take wolf spiders. It's not easy to look in on their family life. They tend to shut the door in your face. So it's best to look for them at night by torchlight. Spiders of all kinds seem to come into their own after dark. Webs are everywhere. But the spiders I'm looking for will be on the ground. The best way to spot these tiny hunters of the night is to hold the torch right up close to your eyes and shine it on the ground. You could see something quite intriguing. Like their namesakes, wolf spiders are active hunters that run down their prey. In the torchlight, the spider's eyes light up like lamps. It's their two large eyes that catch the light the ones that give them their excellent night vision. 
When you get as close as this, you can really see how big those eyes are. But there's something even more remarkable about wolf spiders. The females show a degree of maternal care that you simply wouldn't expect among spiders. Like all spiders, the female encloses her eggs in an egg sac, a cradle lined with the softest silk. The best way for this active spider to keep an eye on her future offspring is to drag them behind her wherever she goes, rather like pushing a pram in reverse. But few spiders risk putting all their eggs in one basket. A magnificent spider has finished the first stage of her egg sac. Now she's laying her eggs, pouring them out like water from a tap. She can lay several thousand eggs over a single season. Now she has hours of weaving ahead of her before the eggs will be safely enclosed. Every species of spider makes a different kind of egg sac. The net caster rotates hers as she weaves. Both male and female spiders have silk glands but only females can produce the silk used for egg sacs. This female seems to have a marvelous eye for symmetry, and yet she sees nothing of what she's doing. Her only guide is her sense of touch. As she progresses, she uses several different kinds of silk. The final layer is colored for camouflage. Like a jewel box, a spider's egg sac is open to reveal emerald green spiderlings. The newly hatched spiderlings stay close to their abandoned nursery until they've molted. There's a certain safety in numbers. These young spiders have spent the first few weeks of their life cushioned against the elements and safe from predators. Very soon now, they'll be taking their chance with both. Female huntsman spiders have a strong protective instinct. They guard their young ones and even provide them with food as they cluster around her mouth. Any disturbance and the whole cluster reacts in unison. The wolf spider we saw trundling her egg sac behind her carries maternal care even further. It's she who breaks open the egg sac to let the hatchlings out. And now, wherever she goes, her spiderlings ride piggyback, clinging to special hairs on her abdomen. As season follows season all around the world, new generations of spiders explode into life and disperse. Many will span the spaces of the earth using silken bridges. Others will launch themselves into the air to be carried far and wide. They've even been found as high as 30,000 feet. Most of these young spiders will live only briefly, preyed on by birds, insects, and even their own kind. Those that do survive will need no apprenticeship in the crafts of survival. A baby magnificent spider already swings her trap line like an expert, though she's smaller than the tip of my finger. And guess what? The scent she's using now lures a much smaller kind of male moth. A young net casting spider makes a perfect miniature net. A tiny ore breathing spider, a born engineer with a genetic blueprint, is making its very first web. 
but it's not easy when there's interference from the sidelines. Getting sorted out in a confined space with so many siblings around can have its problems. like clockwork. These little spiders will eventually spread out into their separate territories. Spiders generally are an antisocial lot. You could call them arachnophobes. But there's one striking exception. In the tropical forests of Australia, New Guinea and Polynesia, a large spider called Cetophora builds an enormous communal web. One of these communities may contain many hundreds of spiders, each with its own closely defended territory and its own orb web. But the webs are densely linked together to form what looks like a giant mist net. When the Cetophora spiderlings hatch from their egg sacs, this beautiful floating city becomes their permanent home. Well, that's the world of spiders. You know, it always surprises me that spiders are so universally feared when out of 40,000 or so different kinds of spider in the world, fewer than a dozen are potentially dangerous to humans. When you think about it, we really owe spiders a debt. They are undoubtedly our best and safest form of insecticide. But for me, as a long time traveler in the world of spiders, it's been a privilege to share with you just a few of the secrets of their extraordinary lives.